It's really wonderful to be back at EGA. So this talk is, is called Notes from the Underground, New and Ongoing Explorations in Ethnopharmacology. And essentially, I'm going to take you on a little walk through some of the social and political factors that drive underground research and use the DMT nexus as a little bit of a case study in some of the research paradigms that uh, exist in the underground. So in order to, uh, I guess, define what underground research is, I'm going to start by presenting some misperceptions of underground research. One of the more notable comments along uh, these lines came from Dr. Rick Strassman a number of years ago, where he said, perhaps what underground researchers are undertaking is more accurately described as self-experimentation in the tradition of who goes first. In addition, a lot of what passes for underground research is the pursuit of pleasure, as well as self-understanding through chemically enhanced introspection. I would not describe either of these as research. I think the value of such activities is limited to providing leads for bona fide scientific projects that qualified investigators could then pursue in the regular manner of clinical research. Now, clearly Dr. Strassman is limiting what even sanctioned research might look like as uh, anthropologists and sociologists don't necessarily engage in clinical research uh, and privileging his own experience with regards to research wholesale. However, if you have any familiarity with psychedelics and underground research and ethnobotanical pursuits, I would suspect that you yourself have likely engaged in research that falls well outside of Dr. Strassman's understanding. So if we look at some of the broader categories of underground research or research more generally, we can actually see that there are rich and interdisciplinary fields that numerous people engage in. So for example, we have uh, botanical engagement, right? We have people who identify plants, who study population ranges, deal with nomenclatural issues, right? If you want to get high off plants or if you want to have spiritual experiences involving plants, you likely need to identify those plants and know where to find them. This goes doubly so for uh, research done in a prohibitionist paradigm where the plants that we're talking about may themselves be illegal or otherwise restricted. We also see the frequent use of analytical chemistry, whether we're talking about things like thin layer chromatography for field analysis, uh, reagents for uh, initial indications in the field, as well as reagents at festivals where people use them to confirm they're getting the substances that they intend to be getting. But then we also see the use of things like gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, uh, and high performance liquid chromatography being carried out by chemists in the underground, some of whom may also function uh, in the above ground world for their day jobs. We see organic chemistry in the case of alkaloid extraction techniques. We see all sorts of anthropology and sociology when we consider the examination of psychedelic cultures, both in articles and books, as well as in the broader engagements of meetings like this, where we come together and analyze what's going on in the communities that we participate in. Additionally, there have been some notable projects involving molecular biology, the potential genetic modification of yeast to produce psychedelic substances, the notion of adding various dopants to uh, psilocybe, cubensis substrates to see what the mushrooms do with those dopants. And then, of course, uh, I would suggest most people are likely familiar with a wide variety of experiential, philosophical, and phenomenological research that seems to logically follow from any sort of engagement with these compounds and experiences. So when we consider how diverse and rich underground research can be, I think it's important to recognize that these histories stretch way back to the beginning, uh, and that Underground research has gone on before prohibition existed. Underground research has continued to go on after prohibition. And it would do the, the fields, I think, a lot of good to recognize sort of these diverse and complementary fields of research. Uh, as it currently stands, we see some interesting divisions between sanctioned and underground researchers that lead to some rather absurd statements such as when Dr. David Nichols made the statement that I would still penalize manufacturers and traffickers of psychedelics in a post-legalized world. Although I think penalties should be rethought, they are probably much too harsh in most states. So it seems like Dr. Nichols may be unaware that he is also a manufacturer of psychedelics. And if he's resting that assertion based solely on the fact that he has a state-sanctioned license to produce, 
given that prohibition wasn't actually established based on any scientific or other legitimate evidence, uh, it seems like it's simply an appeal to the authority of the state, which I would suggest is highly questionable. Similarly, coming back to Dr. Strassman, we see this assertion that underground researchers should become above ground researchers, go back to school, get the requisite training, and then start breaking new ground in a publishable manner. Now, hopefully this, uh, the, the numerous entheogen reviews behind the quote sort of indicates just how much published underground research there is, and the entheogen review represents just one small outlet for this. Uh, I would suggest that again, we see the privileging of peer-reviewed uh, academic institutional approaches, and if we consider some of the literature that's come out over the years, I would say there's at least as much, if not more, significant findings that have come out in those bodies of work. If we're unwilling to grant them any sort of legitimacy or acknowledgement, I think it creates a lot more problems than it solves. In considering what drives research, it struck me that it's pretty similar whether we're talking about sanctioned and unsanctioned research, that really when it comes to human curiosity, whether we're finding people have been given state permission to engage in these endeavors or not, uh, usually it's very similar veins that, that are driving the studies. So I've broken this down to about four areas, and I would assert that we see sort of attempts to address personal or social issues. We see this in the clinical context with uh, studies of um, psychedelics for various mental health issues, um, questions about PTSD, war, um, depression, uh, similarly, we have attempts to gain insight into biological processes. Again, that can be done sort of on the personal experimental level or also, you know, actual fMRI studies into um, brain neuroimaging and what's going on in these altered states. I would suggest we also see a lot of curiosity and research that's done solely for the sake of research, where we may have interesting questions that don't really map onto practical, actionable things in the real world, but are fascinating because they may have some sort of philosophical content or they may have some sort of component to offer us for how we interact with the world around us, or they may just make for uh, interesting afternoons of musings with friends. And last, and certainly not least, uh, we see the desire to dose. And this is true whether we're talking about, you know, people that are conducting ethnobotanical research because they want to uh, have these experiences themselves, or if we're talking about the administration of compounds to different lab animals in order to see what happens. Either way, you know, again, we're talking about the ingestion of psychoactive substances. So I think we can take this one step further and sort of examine some of the dynamics of research as a response to prohibition. And so a brief sketch of what some of this looks like would be, people like drugs, plants synthesize drugs. As a result, it seems pretty straightforward to assert that people will discover plant extractions and people have discovered plant extractions. I would then suggest that prohibitionist policies ultimately serve to alter ethnobotanical relationships. One of the case studies that I was particularly interested in when I was a lot younger was um, Hernan Cortez's conquest of the Aztecs and his recognition that their use of amaranth was not just a food staple, but actually had a, a distinct ceremonial context. And the colonists essentially wiped out, did their best to eradicate amaranth not only in its position as a food staple, but to wipe it out of its ceremonial context as well. Now, amaranth is a particularly good source of vitamin C. Uh, it did, my understanding is that it led to various deficiencies within the populations that were, uh, within the Aztec populations. And so we see a shift in the relationship of people and their, their actual health, right? We see that they're looking for supplementation of vitamin C from other sources. Similarly, if we look at the 1971 UN Convention on psychotropic substances, we see that, you know, with the global prohibition um, put into place by that treaty, this fundamentally changes people's relationships to a wide variety of plants. All of a sudden, you could be facing rather serious jail time for plants that you could have potentially possessed without any consequences whatsoever for decades prior. Uh, and one example that we'll be diving into in a lot more depth is the U.S. case study of the um, actions taken to restrict the access of mimosa hostilis root bark and the subsequent uh, switch to acacias by populations who are not nearly as well acquainted with it as some of y'all are. <laughs> 
I would then suggest that these new relationships that form within a prohibitionist context raise new questions, and that ultimately it's pretty simple to point to the fact that scientific methods uh, help answer these questions, that we can use um, processes to sort of examine and explore these new relationships to answer things that maybe we weren't uh, really considering because we didn't have to ask the questions prior to these various shifts in relationship. And ultimately, as we engage in applied science, we gain more knowledge about plants and drugs. And so we see that even in a prohibitionist context where knowledge is incredibly restricted and we find ourselves uh, forced to go to underground repositories in order to gain insight into a lot of this, those repositories have been steadily increasing just by default of people hoping to have pragmatic engagement with these plants and compounds. So I mentioned the case of uh, DMT availability in the US. And so once again, I'll assert that the desire for extraction uh, was ultimately fueled by the fact that people wanted to have DMT experiences. Following the development of a number of incredibly simple to follow extraction techniques, um, people realized that DMT was a hell of a lot easier to acquire than had been thought, you know, we could say prior to the mid to early 90s. So in the US, the, the plant that was used most frequently was Mimosa tenuiflora, also known as Mimosa hostilis. It was widely available, uh, and eventually a particular vendor named Sonoran Song became the major importer and distributor of Mimosa hostilis root bark in the US. And that middle picture with the sort of coffee bean looking bag and the powder next to it, you could literally order like five pound bags of this without any issue whatsoever. Now, mind you, uh, based on the fact that it contained DMT, it it was completely illegal. However, in 2012, Sonoran Song was busted by DEA and Immigration Customs Enforcement. Uh, my recollection is they never actually charged them, but they did raid them at gunpoint, uh, made them surrender all their material, their records, things of that nature, and even though they tried to come back selling other ethnobotanicals, they never really reestablished themselves. So as a result of that, Suddenly all of these Americans are at a loss for uh, how to acquire their DMT source plant. Luckily for us, there was this really rich body of acacia research that was coming out of Australia. In fact, uh, some of that was instigated or contributed to significantly by folks who are likely in this room. One of the first things that popped up was Acacia Confusa, where you could find it all over Amazon, or sorry, eBay, in places where you know previously maybe you could find Mimosa hostilis, if that. And so as underground communities who were outside of Australia began to engage in acacia research, we saw that, that certain gaps were able to be filled in. We saw that some underground teams who had access to analytical machinery were happy to use that machinery to analyze acacia. Uh, and really we saw more collaborative efforts to build out these bodies of knowledge. So, Something also that I think bears mentioning is the fact that as we see these, these new types of engagements and new questions, it actually uh, also tends to instigate the need for new harm reduction approaches. So we can say that, that this was true with regards to harvesting, where um, there were a few notable instances in Australia of people who appeared to be stripping trunk bark from acacias for commercial scale extractions. We saw some similar issues with uh, major uprooting of uh, Mimosa hostilis in Brazil that appeared to be, again, for DMT production. And also with the ubiquity of DMT, with this desire fueling all of this research and the research leading to easier extractions and easier availability of the compound, you know, there was the very real issue of how to deal with people who might have never had the interest to pursue DMT themselves, but were now able to get their hands on it by virtue of it being so readily available. Um, to take it from the 2012 position, you know, for, for those of us in North America, uh, it was immediately apparent that there were notable differences between Mimosa tenuiflora and the acacias. And obviously there's also differences between a number of the DMT containing acacias that have other alkaloids in them as well. We were very used to pure DMT, Mimosa hostilis is pretty clean as far as uh, its alkaloid profile. And a lot of Americans were rather unsettled or less than happy with the mixed alkaloid content they were getting out of their acacias. 
In turn, this essentially led people to pursue uh, techniques for separating DMT from NMT, and a few enterprising people actually stumbled on a really simple method where you add um, dry ice to your solvent after pulling it. The NMT precipitates out as NMT carbamate, and then you can take that solvent and uh, finish up your DMT extraction. Now, as that was getting greater attention, uh, a few notable Australians became very vocal about the importance of engaging with the total alkaloid fraction from acacias. Once again, some of those people may be in this room. And as they suggested sort of interrelationships and, and enhancements from to having DMT and NMT and maybe some of the beta carbolines, if those were coming across as well, this drove other researchers to question whether or not NMT and these other alkaloids were offering anything. So we began to see certain folks offer bong hits of NMT to, to see if people were willing to try this out, to see if this was active by itself. Now, at one point, last time I was out for EGA, uh, I was offered a bong hit of NMT and experienced no effects by itself. However, uh, as Martin Williams will be talking about later, the entourage effect and the interaction between these alkaloids is a question that hasn't really been sussed out. And when we look at the relationship between tertiary amines and uh, secondary amines, such as NMT and DMT, or baocystin and psilocybin, things of that nature, there are questions about whether or not these alkaloids may interact with each other and lead to different effects than would be encountered from just uh, pure psilocybin, pure DMT, uh, et cetera. So we can see the way that these discourses and dialogues really generate all sorts of interesting research, not only as a result of the practical, actionable desire to obtain DMT, but then all of the interesting questions and debates and personal viewpoints that come up around it. So to look at some of the uh, research dynamics that I had suggested earlier, right, things that motivate this sort of research, uh, I've picked three real world examples that seem particularly relevant at this moment in time. So the first one is the addressing of socio-political issues, uh, issues of, of folks who have been called the Bufo gangsters and their relationship to 5-MeO-DMT uh, as obtained from the uh, Bufo alvarius toad. And um, we'll also take a look at the desire to dose and research into Diploteris carburana, which some people have referred to as the home extractor's holy grail for DMT. And then we'll also look at curiosity and research for the sake of research and the questions of what happens if you add various dopants to Psilocybe cubensis substrate. So in, in considering the, the Bufo gangsters, uh, in the event you're not aware, there are two particularly notable people, uh, Octavio Rettig and Jerry Sandoval, who have been dosing uh, quite a few people with 5-MeO-DMT. Now, I would suggest the reason that these people are in a position of power in the first place is because folks have a desire for the 5-MeO-DMT experience, and uh, in a prohibitionist context, these are the people willing to take the risks to provide this compound to other people. Now, prohibition creates this information gap and ultimately builds the niche for folks like Octavio and Jerry to enter. And to be clear, they're involved in a few deaths around this. There have been rapes, sexual assaults, the use of tasers on people who are under the influence, um, administration of hape against people's will repeatedly while they're under the influence, uh, the use of waterboarding techniques. I mean, some really brutal stuff. And so, the dynamics of prohibition ultimately contribute to, uh, to demand for this ethically questionable product on a hazardous terrain. And again, that hazardous terrain is purely the result of prohibitionist dynamics. In, in this GIF, you can see Octavio stunning somebody who's on the tail end of their 5-MeO experience. So surely there's gotta be a plant substitute that would help to bring the power away from these folks and collectivize it, make it available to other people who are interested. Uh, and sure enough, there are. There's actually quite a bit of botanical backgrounds relating to 5-MeO-DMT. Folks like Dennis McKenna have done research on varolas. Uh, in the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, he gets into some of his research uh, going back, I don't remember the exact year, but he was able to get grant funding to go down and participate in an expedition where he and Terence and Wade Davis and several other people actually collected a wide number of varolas and they analyzed them and they found 5-MeO-DMT. One of the problems is even uh, sanctioned research runs into issues of reliability, botanical identification, and the folks that they were working with uh, weren't always the most reliable people as far as 
identifying their source plants or sharing enough information that would give clear uh, identification in the industrial botanical context. So there was a lot of questions about what plants were actually being analyzed even as they were finding 5-MeO-DMT. Additionally, we've seen folks like Cooper Trout suggest that digitaria or crabgrass might be a, a viable source of 5-MeO-DMT and some people have actually carried out bioassays that appear to be promising. One of the nice things about digitaria is that it's invasive and widespread and, and weedy as hell. So not only is it like an undesirable plant in most areas, but it seems to grow pretty willingly. And if it was uh, viable, you know, more experimentation is needed, it would present a fairly ready source. And again, it's worth noting that Keeper Trout is functioning in an underground context. Uh, as well as above ground in some of his work. And similarly, Johnny Appleseed, who published a whole bunch of information about Phalaris grasses in the Entheogen Review and other outlets, uh, identified a number of strains that included 5-MeO-DMT, including strains that were mostly 5-MeO-DMT. So in looking at this, this history, it seems like there are clearly source plants that have been identified by notable people that have kind of escaped the more public pop cultural references and engagements with 5-MeO. The list of plants on the right on the slide is, uh, or are plants that have been uh, speculated to contain DMT, or 5-MeO DMT, many do. Uh, a couple of these shouldn't still be on here, but there has been widespread engagement, it just hasn't caught on more broadly. And so considering that these sources exist, I think it's important for us to ask questions about why we see the type of engagement that we're seeing um, beyond just the prohibitionist context, right? Sort of question some of the, the values and, and social components that are feeding this. So one of the reasons why I think we haven't seen a whole lot of plant engagement for 5-MeO-DMT is that a lot of people are kind of iffy about extraction in this context. One of the reasons I would suggest that's the case is because most extractions that are going to pull 5-MeO-DMT are also going to pull NN-DMT. So if you have a plant that has both compounds, you'll wind up with an alkaloid fraction that contains both compounds. Uh, obviously, if you're looking for a pure 5-MeO-DMT experience, that's not going to satisfy you, although again, perhaps certain people would suggest that you should take the total alkaloid fraction and be happy with it. That said, in the event that you're not, um, it's become apparent in recent years that column chromatography can actually be quite effective at separating 5-MeO-DMT and DMT, whether you're using silica uh, or ion exchange resins or other approaches, it's actually fairly straightforward. The, the question that seems to throw a lot of people is what sort of solvent systems might be used. Now, I'm not gonna get into that here. There have been a few uh, published, both peer-reviewed and underground suggestions for this. It looks um, like it should be quite viable. Some people have reported success. And so perhaps then we could say that the major barrier to this is the expense of glassware. That laboratory glass, you know, you can look at, at chromatography columns that could run from 500 to 1,000 bucks for um, something that would be sizable enough to actually yield um, a workable amount of material. Well, one of the interesting things about chromatography columns is that they're pretty straightforward. It's essentially a tube of glass with a little uh, stopcock and, and spigot on the end. Um, most glass blowers could likely produce some sort of uh, functional column for a fraction of the price that you would see through online vendors of scientific labware. So I would suggest that there could be quite a bit of research into the isolation of 5-MeO-DMT from plant sources. That then raises, I think, broader social questions, right? Is toad harvesting a question of sociocultural and economic values rather than botanical options? If we have these options, but people are choosing to do what's easier, what's simpler, where they can simply you know, fly to Mexico and go have an experience with a potentially hazardous shamanic practitioner, and they're choosing that over the apparent difficulty of engaging in the research to do home extraction, you know, maybe there's some considerations around the values that we espouse with regards to DIY and personal approaches. Uh, I think we also need to ask questions about whether or not toad plantations are ethically defensible. I mean, I know that processing large amounts of grass is a real pain in the ass, but considering that many of these toads, uh, or the, the bufo toads, require pretty large amounts of space, and as I understand it, in many of these plantations are not getting sort of the basic quality of life that 
any living creature deserves, um, again, there's a problem. And if we're putting our desire to get high before the uh, you know, actual living circumstances of the animals that we're using to get high, I would suggest that once again, we've got an issue with values, even as certain people are maybe espousing uh, how elevated or conscious or whatever they are. So looking at Diplotaris cabrana and DMT self-sufficiency, there's a, a, a really good, another really good example of how prohibition dictates the plants that we work with. And I would posit that when it comes to plants in a prohibitionist context, really we're looking for things that are incredibly hardy, that are versatile, uh, things that aren't particularly conspicuous, and that have a high alkaloid content, right? We want a plant that could ultimately grow in as many places as possible, as easily as possible, and yield as much workable material as possible from as small a starting amount. So I would suggest that uh, DCAB actually addresses a lot of these issues. And, you know, uh, SNU was quick to point out the other night that, yeah, sure, it's fine if you can grow a tropical liana, but the thing I would suggest is it can also be grown as a house plant. It seems to do pretty well with low humidity. It seems to uh, actually be pretty simple to, to keep indoors, move outdoors. Um, we're still sort of in the early early stages of, of working with propagation and broader dissemination of this plant. But just at a glance, if we compare it to the trees like mimosas and acacias, we have a faster growing plant that is uh, easier to keep in the house than, than pots where you're moving trees indoors and outdoors. And for whatever it's worth, you know, I do know folks up in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, who grow acacias and, and have them in pots and move them in during the winter and out during the summer. But again, I, I would suggest that DCAB offers uh, a simpler approach. If we compare it to some of the psychotrias, we've got a higher alkaloid content and a plant that seems, particularly when compared to Psychotria viridis, to be able to deal with more adverse conditions, right? To, to be able to work in a less humid environment, to have a higher outcome. I mean, it seems to outperform it in most of the relevant areas. And when we consider uh, phalaris and other grasses, you know, not only do we have a cleaner alkaloid profile with the decab, but we also don't have to deal with the hassles of propagating and harvesting grass, which can be a major hassle beyond the fact that some of these grasses only grow in clumps. So picking those clumps is not the most fun. And then the actual breakdown of that material is a lot harder and more intense and involved than leaves from decab. Finally, having uh, some trusted cultivators who've gotten their hands on this plant over the last year, year and a half, it actually appears to be incredibly easy to clone with minimal effort. So basically taking woody sections of the plant, cutting them off, and sticking them into field moistened, uh, field capacity, sort of like you'd see with like mushroom substrate, coconut coir that's been uh, rinsed to get rid of all the tiny particulates so that you just have the larger fibers. Um, it actually roots in incredibly vigorously uh, indoors, outdoors. Uh, here's a plant, the, the large plant on the left is the, the mother, and then you can see pictures of some clones as well as the roots sort of shooting through uh, the bottom of mason jars. So again, uh, as this has become available, you know, yes, I think there's important discussions to have around bioprospecting and issues that come, come up around who owns and who should have access to indigenous knowledge. There's also um, you know, the realities of prohibition and that these pressures drive some of these uh, explorations. And so I think the last uh, sort of avenue of research that we'll have time to look at today is this project of doping mycelial substrate. And so there was a, a German researcher named Gartz who basically wanted to see what would happen if he added various tryptamines to uh, Psilocybe cubensis substrate. And he initially started with DMT, but he also did DET. And so this chart that's up here shows that when he added DET to the Psilocybe substrate, he found that it was getting uh, phosphorylated by the mycelium. And so you know, he found in all of his analyses the presence of 4-H-O-D-E-T, and in some cases, the presence of 4-P-O-D-E-T. And so Shulgin went ahead and referencing some of this research said, you put DMT in and you get 4-hydroxy-DMT out, and this is psilocin. Maybe if you put Mickey Mouse in, you would get 4-hydroxy-Mickey Mouse out. If a plant, 
a mushroom mycelium in this case, is given a man-made chemical, and this plant converts it, using its natural capabilities, into a product that had never before been known in nature, is that product natural? What is natural? This is the stuff of many long and pointless essays. So again, you can see that even Shulgin is acknowledging the benefits of research for the sake of research, right? Answer, asking these curiosities. And perhaps in this case, we can see sort of the convergence of research for the sake of research and actually uh, actionable outcomes, right? The production of novel tryptamine compounds that may be psychoactive, that may offer novel uh, experiences of reality. We don't know until we try. Additionally, um, we have on the DMT nexus additional evidence for the GARTS findings in both 2012 and 2018. One of our chemists who goes under the moniker Benzyme actually did a 10 millimolar a uh, solution of, of tryptamine hydrochloride added to the substrate and found on average, at least in his 2018 experiments, uh, a 6% increase in psilocybin. So I would suggest that there's a lot more research that could be done with that. He reported that the uh, fruiting bodies bruised incredibly easily and that the experience was much more uh, similar to uh, psilocybe semilanciata rather than the, uh, or Yes, uh, rather than cubensis, just as far as its potency. So this, of course, inspired um, more curiosity and, and the, the question of, well, um, what happens if we add Mickey Mouse to the substrate? Can we produce you know, novel compounds? And people decided to set up the experiments. So they started with melatonin. Uh, melatonin was chosen because it was easy to get a hold of, it's not watched, and because nobody was really sure of what the biotransformation might be if we compared it to non-acetylated uh, tryptamines. And so the experiment actually, uh, there was analysis done as well, TLC and GCMS, and the bioassay, uh, I think four bio, three or four bioassays were done in total, and the uh, individual in question reported the substance as being totally not psychedelic, but when he went to sleep in the evening, he found that it appeared to have some sort of oneirogenic or dream-enhancing effects. Now, one of the interesting things about the analysis is that it seems to suggest that there was the creation of a novel but closely related analog of melatonin. Current speculation is something along the lines of 4,7-dihydroxymelatonin, but we're waiting for follow-up with high-resolution liquid chromatography, and uh, there, there are currently other experiments being done to confirm the findings of the melatonin addition. Uh, additionally, we're looking at doing similar experiments with 5-MeO-DMT and mexamine, which is 5-methoxytryptamine. The desired outcome is the creation of novel 5-MeO compounds, and there's not really uh, any clarity as far as whether or not this will work. As far as we know, nobody else has attempted this. So hopefully we'll have some results along those lines in coming months. That might be a little optimistic, but hopefully within the next year. So I hope that, that all of this uh, information sort of contextualizes the world of underground research and can show how diverse it is, uh, can show you know, whether we're talking about the manufacturers of, of Orange Sunshine or rogue ethnobotanists or online forums. Um, we have rich histories of research that have taken place outside of the academy, outside of various institutions. In fact, we frequently see that, that outside of the academy, this sort of research dovetails with uh, political stances, with ways of being in the world, with recognitions that it's not just drugs, but it's, it's drugs and their intersections with society. And I think if we take these vast bodies of work into account and consider the fact that the bodies of underground research dwarf those of sanctioned research and see all of these veins running through it, um, I think we can recognize a lineage that is being uh, perhaps whitewashed at the moment, right? As we see the wide-scale perpetuation of prohibitionist narratives around psychedelics and the need for medical control, the and entering of numerous corporate actors into the space, I think there are a lot of concerning dynamics, particularly around how underground research into these plants and compounds is being treated. There's currently a few corporations in the US that are getting into this. 
around psilocybin research. There's a Chinese firm, M2Bio, that just appeared that's explicitly talking about regulatory engagement and uh, essentially looking to get into the commercial production of psilocybin, same thing as we're seeing in the US. And the narratives around who should have access to these compounds as espoused by people such as Michael Pollan, um, asserting that there needs to be professional medical, uh, essentially monopoly, that it's not safe for the rest of us. I think that if we look both at the histories as well as the research, there's quite a bit of ammunition to push back against some of those claims. And I think at the end of the day, it's really important to recognize that, that one of the most beneficial aspects of underground research is that it, it has, and I would like to suggest always will, promote an agenda of psychedelics for the people. Thank you. Is there any underground research that you know in terms of psychotherapy? And if so, maybe some of the findings that are involved in that. So there's, I mean, you know, underground psychotherapy has been going on for a really long time. And actually, that's not my area of expertise. And I... I think there are a lot of really important concerns and issues around underground therapy, right? Sort of uh, within the professional context of uh, psychiatry, there are, it appears, people who are willing to play around with when people are or are not in a therapeutic relationship, right? And so I think one of the perhaps most important things to recognize about underground therapy is that it's still therapy. And that I would suggest even beyond that, right, uh, in the event that you have sanctioned therapists who are also choosing to engage in underground therapy, if it looks like therapy and it smells like therapy, it should be considered therapy. So if people meet at a party and engage in some sort of sharing of traumas while under the influence of potent psychoactives, and one of those people is in the authoritative position as a public therapist, um, it should be recognized that they've uh, entered into some of these dynamics and, you know, uh, the notion of then engaging in sexual contact with that person should be off the table. The notion of uh, engaging in other sort of non-therapeutic relationships with that person, I would suspect, should be off the table. And as much as people say that, you know, underground therapy falls uh, prey to the fact that there is no real oversight and things like that, um, if you look through even peer-reviewed published papers, there are long histories of uh, impropriety within sanctioned psychedelic therapeutic contexts. And so, I think when we're talking about the, the treatment of traumas in therapeutic contexts and the potential for transference and all sorts of other engagement when people are having such profound experiences, you know, whether we talk about above ground or underground, there's a huge myriad of issues and I don't think we've done a good job of addressing them at all. Uh, my question about doping uh, the mycelium of psilocybin mushrooms, uh, are there, have there, has there been much research on the um, other uh, uh, doping agents that are more uh, uh, readily available and less suspicious. For instance, you look at uh, Penaelina fonsecchiae, which is not psychoactive at all on an old lawn, but can contain noticeable psilocybin if it's heavily manured. There's a lot of urea, uh, urine and such in the uh, substrate for the grass that it grows with. As far as I know, there hasn't been a lot of investigation into it. It seems like the most um, common attempts at engagement are sort of replication of the uh, tryptamine hydrochloride approach because people are looking for more potent mushrooms. Obviously, tryptamine HCL isn't the easiest thing to get your hands on. Um, that being said, you know, the, the procedures for doing this are published. Um, the, the experiments that people have conducted on the Nexus are out there with their methodologies. The Gartz papers are available, and he does a pretty great job of documenting his methodologies. So I would suggest, and, and part of the intention of those last three examples, was to sort of highlight areas that are, have, have been uh, engaged with, but also are ripe for further engagement. And I would suggest that anybody who's capable of growing mushrooms at home is likely capable of carrying out some of these experiments, the, the place where it usually falls flat would be getting analysis. Well, luckily at this point, you know, there are communities that have access to analytical techniques and, you know, whether they're folks that you might be able to speak to here or reach out via the Nexus or other online communities, um, you know, we've got a lot of interest and passion for making this stuff happen. So if, if somebody were to dope something and want to get analysis, I'm sure that could be worked out.